Um, I'm Sheila Cote Meek, and I'm the director and a professor in the Indigenous Educational Studies uh, programs at Brock University. And I'm really excited to be able to um, have uh, two of our chapters uh, in the book highlighted by two um, groups of authors. Uh, one is a single author and the other one is has a group of authors here today. So I'm going to start by uh, introducing uh, Dr. Carrie Chichu, um, who is is Q, I probably said that wrong, Carrie, sorry about that, from the community of Long Lake, number 58, First Nation, which is located in northwestern Ontario. Uh, Carrie is a mom, a kokum, a grandmother, and a scholar who works to both resist and subvert systemic and structural and institutional racisms. Dr. Chichu is a Cree scholar who uses poetic in inquiry which is an arts-based methodology in a good way that connects her spirituality or spiritual aptitude for writing with educational research. She situates her pedagogy both um, a praxis of ethical relationality and her NISCA methodological framework, which is framed by protocol Mama Watson, uh, or engaging inner mindfulness and reciprocity. So welcome, Carrie, and over to you. Watch Amy Gwitch. I really appreciate that. Um, all right, I'm going to switch over to my uh, PowerPoint and I will continue my uh, introduction there. One moment. Okay. Oh, I don't know what it's doing. It's not the way. <laughs> there, there, you got it. We just have okay, to perfect. Talk about. It. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to turn my camera off, and um, I'll be here chatting. So welcome to um, this portion of the presentation, which I'll be talking about my chapter titled Inside Out or Storying Through Truths and Reclamation. Um, as indicated previously, um, I am Dr. Carrie Chichu. I am an assistant professor and chair at um, Wilfrid Laurier University, and I am in the Indigenous Studies, Law and Social St uh, Justice Department. And I want to say watch it. Um, I always begin any kind of conversation or presentation with situating myself and indicating, you know, who I am and how I locate myself. And I do this so that uh, we build a good relationship together. So before I do that, I want to acknowledge that I am a visitor on the tra traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. And onwards. So, uh, miigwech, Sheila. Uh, I am from Long Lake Number 58 First Nation. Um, this is a slide that indicates where my community is. If you're familiar with North Northwestern Ontario, you'll know that it's about uh, four hours ish from Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is where I grew up. I've never lived in my community. Uh, my father. Um, was apprehended and taken to residential schools. And when he aged out of uh, residential schools, he ended up uh, being disconnected, of course. The assimilationist policies were successful and he was una unable to reconnect with his family. So he moved to Thunder Bay and um, that's kind of where, you know, we, my brother and myself grew up. So that's a portion of where I'm locating myself uh, further to location. Um, I want to show you some images. So this is like my family. I want to locate and remember who I am and create community with each of you by showcasing um, my relationships. So on the left hand side, you'll see my maternal grandmother and my maternal grandfather. The top is uh, my mom and dad. <laughs> The middle is my brother and myself. Um, and on the right is my paternal grandfather. So you'll see my grandfathers, they're both traditional. 
but you know, we sometimes we need to locate ourselves and what traditionality means. So my maternal grandfather, he um, was, you know, he followed like the Palo Trail. He was traditional in the sense that he, you know, dressed in regalia and he followed, you know, dancing and he had a dance troupe and all these things. And then my paternal grandfather, he ended up, you know, living off the land and doing the best he could with harvesting. And all of these spaces serve to locate myself. And I include my brother and myself in the middle because within this family structure, we are, um, my brother and myself are Cree from different territories. And my, um, my entire family is Anishinaabe or Ojibwe. So it's been difficult to navigate, you know, being adopted from different spaces and then into the space of, you know, familial, um, you know, contextualities. So this is where I really locate myself um, in the Middle East and myself and my partner, Patrick. Um, and I really try to engage the space of ethical relationality, which I'll be speaking to more later. But um, so I, we have five children. They're all adults and we have three grandchildren. And this is the the right, the photo on my right is like myself with my oh, three grandkids. Um, and then you'll see my plant friend, that is Medusa. Um, she's pretty uh, like vigorous and thriving. <laughs> and then my pet friends and the one, small one on the left is Dr. Elliot and the larger one is Kratos. And it's important for me to show you um, the different relationships in my life because this is how I locate myself. Like this is my family and this is how I remind myself of who I am. All right, so the goals of this presentation is to share the importance of engaging in ethical relationality and making community as an Esquail scholar and educator. And another goal is to speak to and through the intertextualities, potentialities, and complexities of Minno Pimatisuan. If you're not familiar with that term, it means a good life. Um, and also to engage and embody best practices around student engagement and support. I feel like I'm rushing a little bit, but I want to ensure that you know we both have our presentations in a timely manner. So my critical pedagogies are based on honoring my Cree way of knowing. And I do that through a collaborative creative praxis by engaging my ancestral aptitudes and conversational methodologies. I also strive to honor indigenous epistemology by resisting and reforming Western thought by engaging in ethical relationality and honoring kinship systems. So there again is that ethical relationality piece, which I'll be speaking to um, right now. <laughs> All right, so this is how I actually ground myself. This is how I frame everything I do. When I am moving forward with any kind of a relationship, I strive to make sure that I'm engaging ethical relationality. So typically I talk about safe spaces and all these good things, but um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna just kind of break it down to explaining these two things and how I work from these two spaces. So um, Dwayne Donald, amazing scholar, he says that eth ethical space is a space of possibility that can only be created when we are dealing with two different worldviews or knowledge systems. So when we think about that broadly, we can think about Indigenous and non-Indigenous learners and scholars. And then from that space, we can think about ethical relationality and how it doesn't deny difference, but instead it seeks to deeply understand how our different histories and experiences position us in relation to each other. So in order to have like fulsome, robust uh, relationships with students, with colleagues, with friends, peers, family, um, I think it's always good to go in with it, knowing the dynamic that you're accountable to the energies that you bring with you, that you're you know, your engagement with different synergies um, is reliant on your transparency, you know, who you are as a person, being accountable to that space, being accountable to really considering the thoughts that are in your head before you go ahead and say them, right? So this is the space where I work from. 
So ethical relationality is a concept that respectfully supports the space of Indigenous and non-Indigenous perspectives while acknowledging truths about our shared histories and relationships. So when we talk about something like Canada's atrocious histories and that historical consciousness piece that should be aligned with, you know, the different pieces that we take up and we try to navigate history. Uh, we need to acknowledge that we are all responsible for some things in some ways, right? So when it comes to reconciliation, Indigenous people have nothing to reconcile, but recognizing that there are allies and accomplices who are willing to work with us to have a better future for the next generations. Those are some of the good pieces that I like to consider when I talk about ethical relationality. All right, so on to the chapter. Um, so my chapter explores a trifecta of themes, you know, one being storytelling, another being Indigenous education, um, theory and practice, and creating culturally sustaining pedagogies. So to engage storytelling, I share my lived experiences as a literacy resource teacher in this chapter. And um, I have shared two lived experiences and I wanna share that um, a, I'm an Ontario certified teacher and I remain in good standing. Um, and I've been certified since 2014. And you have no idea how happy I am to see that there have been seismic shifts in Indigenous education have, you know, that have occurred since then. So, you know, we can really thank these amazing, um, you know, dynamos like Sheila and Taima just for going ahead and forging the path for all of us to become these better scholars and better educators. Um, so I wanna share that before I was a university prof, I was, uh, you know, I was a literacy resource teacher and I was also the librarian, which I wanna share is like probably one of the best jobs you could ever have. You know, you get to see so many students and just read with them and share. It's such a good space to be in. Um, but when I was hired to become a, you know, a resource teacher, I was trained like that. I, my education is grounded in um, specializing in Indigenous education. Uh, it was in this school that I really became acquainted, or I guess I could say reacquainted with epistemological violence that encouraged a, like a me versus them mentality. And it could have been because I was new to the profession, new to the community, or because I am an esque or a woman with children of her own, that I felt that I needed to kind of push back and resist that ignorance. And the ignorance I'm talking about is the violence of settler teachers who also worked in the school with me. Um, you know, hindsight, of course, is always 2020. And when I look back, I recognize that I was not prepared to work with teachers who were hired because of lack, you know, and lack is evident in so many spaces, you know, there's a lack of certified teachers, there's a lack of funding dollars, there's a lack of being um, able to draw educators to a semi remote place. And, you know, quite frankly, we were in different places professionally, I was hired to, um, you know, to promote and shift the different ways uh, the community wanted to move forward. And they had a school board educational plan and I was on board with that plan and I was trying to move forward, but uh, my presence created tension. Um, and I couldn't shift these teachers away from, I didn't even know this was something that occurred, but people like teaching from a box. It's like a literal box on the floor and you just choose like what day it is like February 26th. And whatever's on that page is what is taught to the students. So that was uh, something I was surprised to see. And I tried to create strategy after strategy to improve uh, student literacy, but they were ignored. And I think it was because, well, I didn't think, I realized that there was some anti-Indigenous uh, racism happening. And it was because I was an Indigenous educator that I was disregarded. So, uh, I did walk into several anti-Indigenous conversations about me creating more work for everyone in the school because I 
was trying to push the educational plan forward. And I was trying to create and uphold strategies and policies about student safety and wellness as being number one. Uh, but it was like a difficult space to be in. I actually encountered a lot of different violences, even to coming right down to, you know, providing fresh fruit to the students I interacted with daily, which, I mean, as a librarian, I interacted with grades like JK right to grade 12. So on to my next narrative, I want to share that, um, you know, as a literacy resource teacher, it was my job to pre prepare students for the EQAO um, testing, which is standardized testing that's administered province-wide. And it's used to um, assess student success with literacy and math. So uh, I was pretty shocked to see the stats coming out of our school, but not shocked overall because we all know that Indigenous schools are chronically underfunded. And um, when I was preparing students to become familiar with the process of the actual testing, you know, we couldn't coach them, we couldn't put any input into anything. There's no chatting with your peers. You know, I tried to provide strategies on how to use our time efficiently. Um, but we're already in deficit once I saw the questions. And I don't know if anyone has actually engaged with the questions that EQAO has crafted. But um, they were questions like, what are the white birds that we see all over? And what rumbles underground and gets us from point A to point B? Like this was a space where a plane was a remote possibility of seeing. So there was no seagulls in this community. And um, you know, what is rumbling underground? Like a subway. So because we couldn't actually, you know, coach the students to be um you know knowing what these things were they were like already at a deficit because they couldn't even fathom what these things would be so despite all of the prep those you know questions were incomprehensible there was no way to teach the test which is you know what us do, a lot of teachers do and um unsurprisingly the school scored extremely low again um and I don't know if you know this or not, but the government tactically uses information from accumulated scores to determine and underscore where successes and failures lay. So when we have this aggregated data, which is also, I wanna remind you under an engagement of data sovereignty, um, I worked with other literacy, indigenous literacy experts, and we determined that we, we're going to always be in this cycle of being chronically underfunded because we had low literacy scores, which meant the government did not want to put dollars into the space, right? So, um, you know, time and time again, funding continues to be reduced, literacy program is canceled, programming is canceled, and First Nation children are always left in deficit. So, you know, something I grappled with then, and I still grapple with is how could you know, a small core of determined Indigenous educators promote uh, Mino Pimatis win, let alone flourish in that space. And honestly, like colonial, co colonialism is ugly and it's really, really persistent. All right, so the next theme I wanna talk about is engaging Indigenous education theory and practice discourse. And I wanna share that there is no singular practice. I mean, if it was, there was a singular practice that would be an antithesis to Indigenous education, right? So I was reading a lot of different pieces written by Indigenous scholars like Batiste, Donald Hart, Youngblood, and I was struck by the fact that while we may have differences in pedagogies, the foundation remains the same. We all desire to shift the education that our kin receive, and we want new generations to reach for the stars because that's where all of our relations are, right? We want our children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, all of their children to be rerouted and learn from the land, which is actually their land. So we are collectively working to shift the periphery and the boundaries and dismantle the barriers upheld by anti-Indigenous racisms and ongoing colonialism. So as mentioned, there is no singular Indigenous education theory and practice discourse. 
Um, but what there is, is a large collective of Indigenous scholars collaborating in a way through their own epistemological spaces that includes worldviews, ways of knowing, and ways of being. So I know this and I share from my own positionality as a Cree scholar educator. Um, but I also incorporate teachings from those whose scholarship resonates with my own pedagogy, and that includes like people like Bell, uh, Carlson, Mantanera, and Vowell. And you know, it's really rewarding to see that distinguished scholars such as uh, Linda Smith ruminate similarly about collective educational movements. Um, she has gone on to say that, say that I know that I gain new insights about my context when I read what others have said about their context and experiences. It is serendipitous that scholars write about matters that are shared by other Indigenous people across jurisdictions or do we indeed have shared experience and a shared struggle in Indigenous education? So this makes good sense because the very process of sharing experiences and sharing struggles generates community through a common goal, right? We want our children, our youth, and our young adults to thrive. Okay. Um, and then, so, you know, moving through this trifecta, I wanted to also talk about, you know, engaging culturally sustainable pedagogies. And I share through truths and reclamations. So I'm taking us on this journey, I'm gonna circle back and, you know, wrap it up in a moment, but I want to share that, um, you know, when we make these integral connections, I wanna to speak to the spaces that are critical to me as an Esquail you know, or a Cree woman, right? And I know that there's a pedagogy out there that some of us may recognize as, you know, a conceptualization of goodness um, or the red road. If you're not familiar with that term, it's like where you, um, you're kind of in this space where you're not partaking in anything negative, no negative st coping strategies. And instead you're trying to walk on this path that the creator has crafted for us. And I had to first conceptualize um, what, what that red road was. For me, I was taught it through an Ojibwe or Anishinaabe lens, which was always inauthentic because I could never see through that lens. I couldn't participate as an Anishinaabe person through that lens, right? So um, because my parents are intergenerational survivors of residential school, they're... Um, their ties to their traditionality, of course, were different. Um, my brother and I attended and watched powwows, but we didn't um, because of adopter and adoptee dynamics and discord. We really just sat on the sidelines as we watched the rest of the family embrace and embody their cultures. So we attended powwows, but we couldn't participate. We didn't have regalia. I witnessed ceremony, but I was not included into the space. So it was a difficult space to navigate as watching, um, you know, watching and listening to my family talk about the Red Road and how everyone is included in that space, but also not being able to engage that space was a, uh, it was uh, difficult to analyze how that was living the good life if only some of us were included in that space. So, um, I also learned um, peripherally that if you chose to do things like drink alcohol or consume drugs or anything or engage in smoking, it was antithesis to the concept of the Red Road, right? And if you choose to do these things, you're essentially out or you're ostracized and your presence could be considered problematic and the space was super unforgiving. And I could never understand how the Red Road was something that was particularly loving and kind and extending grace if we were turning actively turning our backs on our own family. So fast forward to my adult life and away from my adopted family. Um, I realized that, you know, the concept of the Red Road as it was introduced to me was harmful. And I really worked to um, kind of engage in different ways of thinking. And um, 
I didn't understand how things like the impacts of cultural genocide, intergenerational trauma, or 60s scoop, anything like that could just be ignored. Um, I didn't understand how that representation of us, you know, that over-representation of us everywhere, like from incarceration to the ongoing apprehension of our children, medical and health disparities, medical racisms. I didn't understand how none of these things were being brought into that discussion. So I sat with it and I sat with it for years and years and years. I wanted uh, minimal pimatisolin. I wanted the good life, but I did not want to be hypocritical. So I wanted to engage ethical relationality in a way that offered me a, a path to this, you know, quote unquote, red road. Um, then I was introduced to harm reduction, uh, which has been around since the 1980s, but it was new to me. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a strategy, uh, public health strategy um, that works to reduce the harms associated with certain behaviors. And after a while, I started to conceptualize this as a way of, um, you know, imagining the red road in a different way. So I, I'm an, I began to imagine opportunities of intertextualities and, like I said, potentialities and complexities of how I could engage the good life and continue all these good things with this new lens, right? And that's when I realized it, that if I could do the good work to live and work in an ethically relational way through unlearning my biases, which we all have, if I was reflexive and respectful, if I reciprocated along the way, I was making space. And what I was doing was I was making and holding space for those with imperfect pasts and offering opportunities to see um, you know, pimatisolin in a space that is not perfect, that only, you know, not only perfect people can access. Um, once I was offered that lens and I was able to see myself through it, I realized that there are no perfect people. Um, and that we're all medicine, right? So that's what I strive to do. I work to engage all these different things and I work to embody minimum penicillin through this new lens. And yeah, <laughs> that's it. Big wish. <laughs> Thanks very much, Carrie. That was a wonderful um, talk and thank you for sharing your own personal experiences. Um, which, you know, are really kind of foundational to the way that a lot of Indigenous um, educators work, right? Um, and going through this whole process around um, relationality. So we'll have time for questions uh, at the end, but for the moment, I'm going to introduce the next group of uh, speakers. Um, so we've got a, a, a team of four that are presenting next. Uh, Joey Lynn Wabi uh, is Algonquin from the Wolf Lake First Nation. Uh, her Anishinaabe Noswan is Jingwakwe. I hope I said that right, Joey, which loosely translates to spring woman, well, spring woman, which is just around the corner. <laughs> She is from the Caribou clan and has three children who she considered gifts from the creator. Uh, she's also an associate professor in the School of Indigenous Relations at Laurentian University, which is situated on the ancestral uh, territory of Atikmishing and Anishinaabek. Taylor Watkins is a non-Indigenous ally and settler residing in the robinson Huron Treaty territory and the traditional lands of the Atikmishing and Anishinaabek. Taylor is a recent grad from the MA in Interdisciplinary Health at Laurentian University and is currently working as the research coordinator for the Mamuzing Indigenous Research Institute uh, at Laurentian. Anastasia Chartrand is a non-Indigenous uh, ally residing in the robinson Huron Treaty area and on the traditional uh, lands of the Atikmishing and Anishinaabek. She was raised on the traditional lands of the Cree, Ojibwe and Algonquin peoples, as well as Beaver House First Nation. Anastasia is uh, a recent grad of the Master of Science in Communication program at Laurentian and is currently doing a MITAX inter internship with the city of Greater Sudbury. Um, Anastasia is Laurentian University's Nature Positive Coordinator and the Co-Chair of the Environmental Sustainability Committee. 
And last but not least, uh, Marnie Anderson is a proud Anishinaabe Kwe and mixed European uh, ancestry living in the Wanapate First Nation. Recently, she completed the Interdisciplinary Health Graduate Program at Laurentian University. Her interests lie in understanding the environment, health, disposition, treaty history, First Nation marginalization, and Indigenous health policy. So welcome, um, and I'll turn it over uh, to this great group. Just give me a quick moment and I'll share my screen. And so once I share my screen, I won't be able to see anybody. So uh, just let me know when we need to do a next slide. Perfect, thank you, Marnie. And that looks okay. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, to begin, we would like to start our presentation today by thanking both Dr. Sheila Cote Meek and Taima Moke Pickering for the opportunity to publish a chapter in their book. Um, we would also like to take a moment to acknowledge that we as a group, as well as Laurentian University, are situated on the traditional lands of the Atikinishing Anishinaabek and neighboring reserve Wanapate First Nation. We will begin our presentation today by providing everyone with some background information regarding the purpose of our chapter. And next slide, please, Marnie. Perfect. Um, so this is just a basic overview of what we will be talking about today throughout the course of our presentation. Um, so as previously mentioned, we'll start with a very brief introduction regarding the course outline and the course objectives, as well as the structure of the course in relation to the medicine wheel framework. We will talk about the eastern and southern quadrants, as well as the western and northern quadrants as well, and then we will conclude our presentation. So the mutual flourishing in educational settings begins with the recognition that the integration of Indigenous cultural values and ways of knowing are often neglected in Western educational institutions, which is imperative for all learners to understand Indigenous ways of knowing and doing. Valuing and centering Indigenous values in educational areas can help foster a learning environment relevant to Indigenous learners while also providing non-Indigenous learners the opportunity to become informed regarding Indigenous history and culture through an Indigenous perspective. Next slide, please. Thank you. The purpose of our chapter was to share our stories about a 12-week master level course at Laurentia University that was revisioned by an Algonquin Anishinaabe Kwe scholar and a settler graduate teaching assistant using experiential arts, storytelling, and land-based pedagogical practices. And I will turn it over to Dr. Joey Lynn Wabi. Miigwech Taylor. Um, quick way, everyone. Um, just a little bit about our course description. So this program is through Laurentian in the Master of Indigenous Relations. Um, <clears throat> and what we wanted to do was revision it. Um, we, we used the objectives, of course, and, um, you know, didn't sway away from um, the perspectives that were there before, that we, while we are on Anishinaabek territory, and to be respectful of that. So we want to ensure that we were covering that. So uh, the director um, at the time, um, well, now, now still, is Dr. Taima Moki Pickering, and she um, said, Joey, go ahead, do what you want to do with the course, um, you know, so I'm like, hey, that's awesome, and I love that flexibility within uh, our department and our ability to do what we, what, not what we want, uh, within reason, of course. Um, <clears throat> so I pictured it uh, with the natural um, the natural resources from an Indigenous perspective, and so for myself, um, you know, going a little bit deeper than um, an Indigenous perspective, for me, it would be an Algonquin Anishinaabe Kwe perspective. Um, and the allied scholar um, or the allied person that was working with me uh, was and still is uh, Taylor Watkins. 
So that's our course, and that was the course and the course outline that was given to me um, with the encouragement to do what you want to do with this course. Um, so we looked at it from the four elements, so earth, fire, uh, air, and water. And there's a, <clears throat> there's a diagram um, in the chapter. Um, if we can go to the next slide, it might be there. Oh, I think it's in the next couple of slides. Okay. Uh, can we just forward to the one? Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, so we looked at it from um, in the middle, the course being uh, the heart of what we were doing for the 12 weeks, and then looking at the four elements on the outside. And so the first week we went through was Earth, um, and we talked about uh, different concepts. We had two books um, assigned, which were uh, Braiding Sweetgrass and the Mishomis book. Um, one by Robin Wall Kimmerer and the other one by Eddie Benton Benet. And the students um, were to read those, you know, certain stories, um, you know, creation stories and um, chapters from each book. And then what, what we did was we, we always had a guest speaker come in to wrap things together and wrap it up. Um, so we had um, Emily Bourget Tasse uh, from the Indigenous. Um, Oh my gosh, Indigenous Student Affairs, and she came in and she talked about the medicine garden. Um, so in that first week, looking at Earth, talking about creation stories, Sky Woman, the medicines, and then we went to visit uh, the medicine garden on campus. And from that, um, to culminate that, that one aspect and that one element, uh, we did a reflective expression. So they were all connected, each, each, uh, each reflective expression to the element. And then in week two, we had our fire. Our fire was um, talking about, uh, you know, fire building, sustainability, um, talking about how fire um, can give life but can take away life. And we talked about that, um, you know, that, that relationship and talked about a use of fire and ceremony protection, also the rites of passage too. Um, and we had a land protector uh, come in that, uh, that week uh, one of the weeks, uh, Shannon um, Chief from uh, Anishinaabe Moose Studies, and she talked about uh, moose, but she also talked about um, the land that they live on in, in one of the parks up in Algonquin Territory and how they reclaim space up there as a land protector. And we also had Darren McGregor from Sagamuk uh, Anishinaabe come in and talk about fire. Um, and also he demonstrated, you know, how to start fire from natural elements that we find uh, on Mother Earth. Um, and then the next one, of course, was our, our break, um, and we had our reflective expression number two. And then the students were to create stories from the medicine's perspective. So, for example, you know, someone um, talked about themselves as if they were sweetgrass. Um, and then we had an opportunity to open it up to the community and we talked about it from um, from the perspective of the medicine. <clears throat> and then the third week was air. We talked about climate change, um, you know, the balance, the relationship we have with air. Uh, we talked about movement and breath. Um, and also we had a climate warrior come in um, and that was Shelley Essence uh, from um, Beau Soleil, First Nation, and she talked about the importance of, um, you know, Gawain plastic, you know, no plastic, and that was uh, wonderful also. And then the next time, the next week, sorry, the next aspect is the reflective expressions. We had that first, and then the next aspect is water. So we talked about the flow of life, um, you know, same thing with water and fire and all of the elements, um, you know, it can take life and it can give life. Um, and we had someone come in that was a berry faster, uh, Julia Coleman uh, from Wolf Lake First Nation, who did her berry fast when she was 13. So she talked about that. Um, and then to pull it all together, we had a community round table um, and we had invited everyone from the uh, LU community and also from um, the community um, of Sudbury area uh, to come in and listen to the students talk about their experiences. So this was a really fun um, course to teach uh, and also to learn from, because I also learned a lot from each person that was uh, that attended. Um, and I think it, it also allowed us to solidify relationships to not only each other, 
but also to the land and our responsibility. Um, so now we're, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each one, I believe, more specifically. So I'll turn it over to the next presenter. Miigwech. <coughs> Taylor, did you just want to speak on this slide before we get into the sections? Yeah, sure. Um, essentially, this slide uh, entails information that Joey Lynn has already mentioned about the course um, in just the sense that this course did go against uh, the mainstream academic training traditionally found in westernized educational institutions. Um, the course was really structured based on fostering that connection between the learner's holistic health, as well as how that relates to the land and Earth's natural resources. OK, so now we're getting into um, the sections. It's Marnie speaking. I don't know if you can see me, but just so that you know, it's it's me. Um, what we did for the chapter is we split up um, each uh, section for a reflection piece from the students. And so I'm just going to go into Earth, um, but I just wanted to mention that Simon Leslie, he's not on the on the presentation today, um, but he's the one who contributed to the reflection of this chapter as well. Um, he introduced himself as a settler originally from Treaty 3 territory, and he's a student at Laurentian University and, and currently lives in Sudbury. And so um, this was the first uh, few weeks in the first quadrant, so the, the the earth quadrant in the eastern direction and like um, joy was saying it was set up in a way um, along with the academic literature that she had mentioned that we were reading but set up in a way so that we could have lots of discussions um, and so looking into the creation stories it was really um, perfect to have both the uh, um, creation story by anishinaabe in the um, uh, sorry book by the motionless book by robert uh, sorry by edward Benton uh, Bonnie, as well as the Sky Woman story. So these creation stories just helped um, help us understand the relationship with land and its importance and really um, gave a perspective um, from that sense. These stories we know that are often told, they're told in, in a, sometimes it takes a few days to tell them. So it was really nice to be able to, to understand these stories in a way and how it relates to land. Um, going through um, information like the, for example, the Megazite, um, Megas Shell showing up in creation stories to guide Anishinaabe and just understanding how um, the, those relationships work and, and having uh, opportunity to ask questions because sometimes um, it was hard to really grasp the, the vastness of these stories. So a lot of opportunities were allowed um, and discussions were had just to kind of uh, be able to help us give us a better perspective. The white men's footsteps. Um, um, sorry, was the importance of reciprocity as well as this reciprocity was really a consistent theme throughout the the whole, um, I felt like this whole section because we were learning about the honorable harvest, um, which really um, talks about only take when what is given, using it well, um, to be grateful, to, to reciprocate those gifts, and all of these things that were mentioned in Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, but reciprocity reciprocity was really um, something that was discussed in detail because it's something that um, is seen everywhere amongst um, every um, animal and, and plant and, and, and human nation. So the, the last part um, and, and how Simon introduced it in the book was, um, you know, we were talking about all these things and it was really empowering and, and moving. But then um, as we moved into the next section of this earth section, we really started learning about, you know, the mining exploitation and looking at the mining industry and activity across Canada, as well as within Sudbury specifically, because that's where um, our education was taking place um, and the impacts that come with it. And so all of this how it relates in relation to to violence and extraction gave uh, a really good uh, well-rounded view on on um, on the earth on what's happening to it right now how that's all um, affected and related and it was a, a really good start to to the course um, the guest speaker uh, like Joylin said uh, the medicine garden it was really neat to start learning the history because the medicine garden was right at Laurentian University so when she had this uh, speaker come in and she was speaking about sort of these places and pace, uh, places that she started the garden at it was it was awesome to kind of have somewhere to know and we can go visit and we were in the middle of um, 
it was a hybrid course so there was we were allowed to go back to the university after a few weeks but we were able to go see it um, at our own will because it was right at the university so it was perfect <laughs> you can hear me click my papers okay this is the fire quadrant this is just the next section this is the piece that i myself um, was able to to uh, write a background on and, and talk a little bit about my reflections and this was um, a really uh, great quadrant because we had a big discussion around uh, fire building and we had access to the wigwam which was on located on laurentian university and it, it allowed us to have sp um, fires during some of our uh, courses and and um, some of the uh, I want to say like presentation days we were able to go and, and utilize that space and so it was really nice to have that as well as our I'll speak to this later but our, our firekeeper came in and, and spoke more to to fire building. We had uh, forest sustainability um, of course four fires um, inner fire and spirit we had a really great activity about um, on because we learned about the three sisters soup we learned about um, all of the medicines and so we were, had the opportunity to make a three sisters through three sisters soup and, and it almost brought, it brought like a smell and a taste um, as well as a reflection to accessibility of foods because we had uh, participants that were participating from up north and none of in um, Iqaluit and so accessibility of food but we were able to taste and and smell and, and really enjoy some of the things that we were learning and I, I really felt that that was um, unique because we were learning about it we learned the history of how it was so important and then we were able to taste and smell and, and have it at home. Um, people of the seventh fire teaching came um, the renewal and change that came with forest fires because they're they're viewed as destructive but they're also a part of um, renewal and a, a new ecosystem um, and then of course the, the fire use and ceremony utilizing again the wigwam at Laurentian but um, using it in ceremony and in other aspects because uh, there's nation uh, similarly there's nations across Canada that, that use fire in that way um, and then protection, there was a really uh, great conversations around for forest sustainability and old growth forests and really great chapter in Robin Wall Kimmerer's book about um, about old growth forests and, and the protection of them. We were lucky in this section to have two um, guest speakers, the firekeeper and the land protector. So the firekeeper was talking about how First, uh, First Nations view fire as a spiritual doorway and really gave us like a hands-on or a, a visual to see how that fire was created, but how it was created with um, with flint, but also new alternative ways of starting fire, of course, like the, the matches and lighter. Um, and the the sorry the land protector sharing knowledge of protected lands of logging and spoke of repercussions of resource extraction and the harm um, inflicted on and wildlife so she had talked a bit about her advocacy with moose and it was really relatable because although um, she was located in a different location the the way she spoke about sort of the the parks and the protection and the people she had to connect with really uh, gave her perspective no matter where you are there's there's a park and in that advocacy work um, needs to happen so it was really um, enlightening and I, I just I guess to finish with my reflection that I had put into the book um, I'm really grateful for this course and um, the reflexivity woven through the fire quadrant really increased my insight into just perspectives of my own um, and I really enjoyed the the discussion pieces because everyone in the class was from um, a different you know perspective so we were able to to really kind of understand and get a, a really well-rounded view as we were learning and it was timely because it allowed me to reflect on the sacredness of my own inner fire i was going through a lot of grief at the time um, and this really this course the amount of hands-on and um, different modes of, of listening and li hearing stories and doing crafts and um, going to the wigwam really just kind of um, what is that called the interactive nature i guess of the course really allowed me to learn um, how teaching and knowledge can be delivered in a way that's that's memorable and impactful. And uh, yeah, it's just, I'll, I'll stop there because I feel like I could talk about it forever. Um, and I'll just go on to the next part. Okay, uh, hi everyone. It's Anastasia speaking now. Uh, I'm honored to share highlights from the, the West Quadrant, um, which is focusing on the element of air. So, um, I know I was already introduced already, but I do want to say I'm a non-Indigenous person living on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, and I'm learning and working continually on being an ally. And for me, that really looks like a lot of reading and listening right now. And um, this course, I think, was very foundational to that. 
Uh, this course that I had the privilege of being part of, along with writing for this chapter, were really special and, and cherished learning opportunities for me. And I just wanted to start by thanking everyone involved. For, um, thank, you, thank you for inviting me into these opportunities. Um, so the Western Quadrant, um, the Air Quadrant, we focused a lot of our learning on the relationships between climate change, Shkag uh, Makwe, and Indigenous people. We talked about the disproportionate effects that climate change have on Indigenous people facing things like the loss of land and resources uh, to human rights violations. But we also spent time celebrating, so celebrating Indigenous wisdom and innovation, specifically when it comes to things like climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we also explored the significance of air and how it represents mental, mental and, and spiritual processes. Uh, like Joey had mentioned earlier, we did have a guest speaker for this quadrant. Her name is Shelly Essence. She shared stories that emphasize just how important it is to take responsibility for defending Mother Earth or Chicago McQuay. Uh, she shared stories of um, climate action that was community driven that she had been part of and really reminded us that it's our responsibility to future generations to do this work. So there was one quote that even though this course was two years ago, and uh, it really still sticks with me. And it's that uh, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So for myself, I have two kids, young kids under the age of five. Um, this still very much resonates with me and reminds me um, almost every day that I, I need to continue taking climate action uh, for these future generations and working on fixing my own relationship with the nature. Uh, something else that I found really impactful from Shelley's guest lecture was that all of her stories that she um, shared with us were woven with gratitude and acknowledgement. Uh, acknowledgement. So that was gratitude and acknowledgement for things like the land and medicines and elders and knowledge keepers, ancestors. And I think this personally is something that I can work on integrating. Um, and I also, Kiri, I really liked how you had said, we're all medicines. I don't know if I've heard that before, but today that really sticks out to me. And I think that might be <laughs> another quote that will stay up in, in my, my uh, repertoire <laughs> up here uh, as a constant reminder. Um, yeah, so near the end of the air quadrant, we did a watercoloring activity where we used air um, through breath uh, to move paint around a canvas. So we had used straws and we blew paint all around making some, some beautiful artwork. Uh, it was a good opportunity to reflect on all of the learning that happened within the quadrant. So this activity with the paint and the breath, along with the discussions that we had, the st uh, story sharing, uh, all of the reflexive practices that we had the opportunity to, to take part in, uh, specifically the one centered around air and climate change, it really, really helped shape my understanding of my role in the environmental crisis. I remember at the end of one of our classes, we were assigned homework to just go out into nature and, and just breathe. And I spent time watching clouds and I, it sounds simple, but as a student, you don't often take time for that kind of connecting. And I made a note to try to prioritize doing this more regularly, which I know it's been two years and it, it might not happen as often as I would like, but I do remember to do it once in a while. And it's helped me to be more conscious about how I interact with nature and I, how I can work towards being a, a better relative. Um, yeah, so Marnie, if you don't mind going to the next slide, following the West Quadrant, we transition into the final quadrant of this course, um, exploring the North, uh, where we focused on learning from water. So in this quadrant, we had some really great discussions about water, uh, not just it being a basic element, but it being like this incredibly powerful symbol of life and renewal and interconnectedness. So I'll be highlighting key points from the contributions of my classmate, Ariana. So Ariana introduced herself as a social worker and a master's student. And uh, in this chapter, she shares her experiences as a settler living within an Inuit territory of Nunavut. Uh, she emphasized her commitment to understanding and supporting indigenous communities 
and trying to decolonize social workspaces. Uh, so for this quadrant, uh, Ariana shared her summary of the last few weeks of class. And we talked a lot about water as this dynamic force, how it, you know, um, gives life and takes life and that cycle starts over again. And throughout this course, we learned about the medicine cycle and we were able to relate the water cycle back to that continuous cycle of the medicine wheel. Um, we also had an opportunity to watch a documentary that included Autumn Peltier. Uh, it shared a lot of important learnings for us about how water rights impacted Indigenous communities all across Turtle Island. And we had some supplemental reading that focused on colonial governance and different ongoing challenges about uh, Indigenous water rights. And it really emphasized that water is a lot more than just a resource. Uh, it's really woven into culture and identity. So throughout these couple of weeks where we spent time in this northern quadrant, uh, we did have a final guest speaker who we're grateful to hear from. She was a young Algonquin woman. She shared a story that detailed the, her transition into womanhood and rites of passage that she underwent. And these were deeply connected to water. Um, uh, yeah, overall, the North Quadrant was about recognizing the significance of water um, beyond its actual physical properties and understanding that it's a sacred and dynamic force. Thank you. Thank you, Marnie and Anastasia, for, for sharing your experiences throughout, uh, throughout this course. Um, so just to conclude our presentation, so as we move through the Medicine Wheel framework, experiential land and arts-based activities were heavily embedded within each quadrant, where learners have the opportunity to engage in activities, as many of you have heard from Marnie and Anastasia. Um, and these activities included uh, the air bubble art, as you could see in the top picture on the screen, as well as creating keychain resin molds, as you could see in the bottom left image. There was a rhythm and flow to the course creation, implementation, and evaluations of the learners' art creation and storytelling. We incorporated multiple sharing circles, spent time in the wigwam on campus. We worked closely with the sacred elements, as well as followed the body, mind, spirit framework with a focus on community and relational accountability. So nevertheless, land-based teaching and learning is a part of a transformative education and innovative solutions by taking students out of the classroom and onto the land, who is our very first teacher. And Marnie, do you mind just going to the next slide? So we'd just like to end our presentation today by talking about this quote by Robin Wall Kimmer, who is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, so to become naturalized is to live as if your child's future matters, to take care of the land as if our lives and the lives of our relatives depend on it, because they do. And I would like to thank everyone for being in attendance today for our presentation.